How's everybody doing tonight? Hey, all good things must come to an end, right? Sometimes, right? Wouldn't you like to package this all up and just take it home with you? I know I would. That's what I'm going to do when I leave tomorrow and head home to Iowa. Uh, Speaking of Iowa, I don't know if you've watched the news uh, since last night, uh, but Iowa was hit with, uh, especially the central part of Iowa was hit with a lot of tornadoes. And one of those towns was actually Marshalltown, Iowa. I actually served as a, the, a minister there at Hillside Church of Christ after I left here. And my wife worked for Lennox, which is a big corporation there in Marshalltown. And if you've seen some of the devastation uh, of that city, uh, Lennox was one of those places that was hit. Um, and so... Um, on Facebook last night, people were like, is everybody okay back there? We still have friends that kind of live back in that area. You've been there before, Lisa. Um, but uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy. So keep Iowa in your prayers and also c- keep the, victim fam- the victims' families uh, there from Missouri uh, where they were on that, uh, they call it a duck boat, but they were out in that lake and a storm came on them and um, I think it was, was it 17 people uh, lost their lives. It's amazing, yesterday we were talking about devastation and, and how quickly things can happen. And we talked about the flood and the devastation of the flood. And it's not some cartoon uh, character type thing, but there is a lot of devastation that still takes place in our world. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up things. Um, but first of all, let me just say this. I don't know um, if you've ever heard this before, but this is a great video. It's called uh, Is Genesis History? Uh, in this video, it also has Paradise Lost and what we get back as Christians. Uh, but there's some really good information in here, especially when it comes to the flood and the evidence of the flood and, and how the scientists go around and they're interviewed and they go to like the Grand Canyon and talk about the fossils and things like that. So um, I would highly recommend this. Um, I would give this away, but this is not mine. So, <laughs> And of course, Rick is back there hiding behind uh, that wall because he doesn't want to be called on. So anyway... Um, I'm just glad that you guys are here this evening. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, we have a lot of Scripture to cover tonight. I hope that you would not get bored with the things that we're going to talk about uh, this evening. Uh, because I have to tell you this, uh, and I'm going to be honest with you. A, a lot is happening in our, in our culture, but a lot is happening, especially in our churches, where a lot of churches, they don't even want to talk about sin anymore. Um, seriously. Uh, And they don't want to go in in depth and talk about sin. Uh, But, you know, sin is what separates us from God. And sin is what uh, uh, causes all kinds of problem in our world. And sin is what brought death into this world. Uh, But let me just say this. Just going back to Genesis in the very first chapter, Genesis, the third chapter in verse 15. There is a promise that God gave. And it's a beautiful promise because he gives this ray of hope that somebody is going to come and somebody is going to crush Satan's head. And I like that. I don't know about you. I don't know if Adam and Eve understood the ramifications totally from that. But from Genesis all the way through the books of the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, especially the Gospels, it was all about somebody was going to come, somebody's going to crush Satan's head. I think we have that scripture up there. Um, Genesis, the third chapter in uh, verse 15, where it says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Uh, I think I said this on Sunday, but this is known as the Proto-Evangelium or the first gospel. There's a glimmer of hope right there. And this is what God is all about. Uh, Yeah, uh, there was a precept in the Garden of Eden that they had to obey. And of course, they disobeyed that precept, right? And they suffered as a result of of that because in the day they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were going to die. Uh, Physically, eventually they did die, but spiritually they died also. But God said there's also somebody's going to come. He's going to take care of all of this. And I'm thankful I'm on this side of the cross. Um, I, I hope you are too. Um, But let me just say this, 
I don't know where you're at as an individual, okay? Uh, maybe you're here, you're, you're hearing things for the very first time. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. I know some people in this room who have been Christians for a long time. I don't know everybody in here. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're even struggling to believe some of the things that we have been talking about over the last week or so. You know, is, is Genesis a myth? Uh, is the Bible a myth? Can it be trustworthy? Uh, is God's word trustworthy? Uh, and, and you have all these questions. Um, it, you know what? Let me just say this. It is good to have questions. Okay, God answers a lot of those questions right here uh, in his word. And, and that's what faith is all about. Not a blind faith, um, uh, but it's definitely one that you should pursue. And if uh, you're even questioning where you're at in your salvation, you need to talk to somebody. I mean, I would love to talk to you about Jesus Christ. I know Rick would love to talk to you about Jesus Christ. There's other people in here that would love to talk to you about Jesus Christ. Mark Lance about, you know, I could think of a whole slew of people. Uh, You have Clyde, you have uh, your elders here. Uh, But this is a church, let me just say this, that is committed to the truth of God's word. Not everybody likes to hear the truth, right? Sometimes we can't even handle the truth. But this church is committed to the truth of God's word. Um, And so... um, I appreciate that, and that's one of the reasons why we have this vacation Bible school. So enough said. Just let me tell you a little story. I was over in Okinawa, Japan, like, a, uh, like I had told you before. Uh, my wife's uh, brother had just passed away, and um, she developed some pain within herself after we got married, and uh, we found out later what it was, but her brother had passed away, and uh, we got the news, and then she started having some problems, and we didn't know what it was, and we met with the doctors, and the doctors had said that uh, we don't know what it is. It could be cancer, uh, but we're going to have to have surgery to get whatever is in there out of there, and um, um, you're just going to have to believe that we can do something. And so uh, I wasn't a believer, wasn't a Christian at the time. I thought I was, I guess. Uh, but it was just my wife and I over there, and we were scared to death, and um, we didn't know what to do. Well, she started opening up her Bible. Remember that, Lori? And she started getting back to the Lord, and lo and behold, she did have her surgery. It was not cancer. It was called endometriosis, and so she had to have um, that taken care of, and it was just one complication after another. Well, that was the beginning uh, of, uh, of a journey, which I didn't know that I would be on for the longest you know, for, for, you know, I didn't know I was going to take. And we got over here to Maryland. We were transferred over here. And uh, one day she woke up and she said, we got to go back to church. And she talked me into going back to church. And uh, through her, uh, you know, keep on talking to me about the Lord Jesus Christ. Eventually I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I confessed him. I repented of my sins. I was baptized into Christ on March 10th, 1985. Let me just say this. That was the beginning in Christ Jesus. Um, Sin. We want to talk about sin tonight. It's a word that we don't usually like to talk about. I'm sure that everybody in this room has been affected by sin in one way or another. Let's just look at a couple scriptures here. Uh, What is sin? In 1 John, the fifth chapter, in verse 17, it says this, all unrighteousness is sin. 1 John 3, 4, it says, sin is the transgression of the law. James, the fourth chapter, in verse 7, says, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I look at sin and I think about all what sin is capable of doing. Now, I want you to think about your own life. I can only think about my life. And what sin has done in my life personally and what sin has done in my marriage personally and what sin has done in my family. Um, Sin. It's an ugly word, isn't it? Sin is what caused Adam and Eve to be banned from the Garden of Eden. 
Now, I want you to think about your life and think about sin for just a minute here. I was going to have this paper that showed all the sins that are actually in the Bible. And there's so many. And a lot of times when we think about sin, we just think about sin as a lump sum. It's like, okay, sin. There's another word in the Greek, which where we get our word, it's the Greek word is harmateo, and it means to miss the mark, okay? And when you think about sin, yes, it's a transgression against the law, but it's also missing the mark when it comes to Jesus Christ and when it comes to God. Are there any hunters in here? Does anybody like to hunt? Okay, a bow hunt, anybody bow hunt? I know when I first, uh, when, when I was here in Maryland, I had never hunted before, and um, I wanted to get on board with that, and I don't even know who it was. I think it was, maybe, you know, I'll throw some names out there, but uh, there was a guy by the name of Randy Andrews. I don't know if you remember him, uh, but we were good friends with him, Randy and Sally at the time, and um, he uh, had asked to, us to go hunting, and uh, so we he, he, he gave me a bow, and we started to hunt. And uh, I don't know if you know anything about bow hunting, but, you know, you've got a target, which is a deer. True? Okay? And a lot of times when you pull back on that bow, you want to hit that target. But a lot of times it doesn't happen. And there were many times that I was in my tree stand and getting ready to hunt, and there would be a nice deer that would come by or a nice buck, and I'd pull back, and I would miss the target. That's what happens when you and I sin. We miss the target, okay? Sin is unrighteousness. Sin separates us from God. In Romans, the third chapter, in verse 23, it says this, okay? Uh, Sin is the problem. But in Romans, the third chapter, in verse 23, it says this, the wages of sin is death. And you go all the way back to Genesis and you see what has happened as the result of sin. They were banned from the garden. God said that they would surely die. They did die. They were separated from the garden. And from that time on, sin reigned throughout up until now. And sin will continue to reign. So the wages of sin is death. What does that mean to you? Anybody? What's the wages of sin? There's a separation from God. True. Anybody else? Yes. It's a payment for something. It's a payment. Okay, so what do you, let, me, let me just put it this way. What, think about your job. Okay, I don't, you know, I don't know some of your jobs. What do you do for a living? You work for the sheriff's office. Okay, so you have a job. You have, probably have a set of hours that you work for, right? Uh, how many hours a week? 40 or, or 50 hours, okay? So you work for the sheriff's office, okay? Uh, what, do you, what do you do for a living? Anybody here? What do you do? Military. Praise God, right? So you, you, you have a set of hours that you probably work during the day. Does everybody have a job in here? Some of us work 40 hours. Some of us work 50 hours. Some of us work, you know, 60 hours and above, right? Um, so you work and you want to get paid at the end of the week, right? Let's say you get paid at the end of the week. You want to receive a check, don't you? Sure. If you receive a check and you're working for 40 or 50 hours a week, you expect to get paid for 40 or 50 hours a week. Is that true? Could you imagine if you showed up to pick up your check and you were shortchanged maybe 10 hours, but you worked 50 hours, but they only paid you for 40 hours? What are you going to do? Would you be mad? Would you be upset? Would you go into your boss's office and demand, hey, I work 50 hours. You pay me for 50 hours. How many of us would do that? Absolutely, because that's what you worked for. Okay, those are your wages. And if they shortchange you, you're going to be upset. Am I right? Has anybody ever been shortchanged? Okay, and you got upset, and then eventually they paid you, hopefully, if I don't know. So that's what we demand. How come you and I, if the wages of sin is death, we do not demand death? Nobody wants death. Am I right? Nobody wants death. 
But that's what the wages of sin is, is death. But there's not going to be a day where we're going to go to God and say, hey, these are my wages. I want death. Am I right? No. And God doesn't want to give you death. God wants to give you life through his son, Jesus Christ. But that's not what we demand. What we really demand is mercy and grace, don't we? That's what we get because of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and sin is this, this great problem that, uh, that uh, God has said that he would take care of through his son, Jesus Christ. So we have sin. It's a transgression. And let me just say this. The Bible says in James that if you break just one of the laws, you break every single one of them. Every single one of them. Just one. So let me ask you this. Has anybody ever stolen a pencil before? <laughs> you murderer. <laughs> I, I'm serious. Have you ever stolen a pencil, maybe from the bank or a pen from the bank, and you walk out with it? And it's like, oh my goodness, I stole this. But, you know, a lot of us just don't go back and give it back, right? So you just go off, okay? Do you see what I'm saying? James says that even if you break one law, you have broken every single one of them. Wow. So what are we going to do about it? If the wages of sin is death, uh, that's not what we want. We want grace. We want mercy. But we've broken one law. Uh, that means that we're guilty of the entire law. You know, what's going to happen? Well, there is a solution. So, so, so we, we talked about sin. It's a transgression. We're missing the mark. We know that sin is the problem. But there's a punishment that's coming, and that is death. But through death came life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Okay? And this is the cool thing about God. And I'm just talking to you tonight because God devised this plan way long before the creation of the world. He said that he was going to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for every single one of us. And uh, for those that uh, would uh, be obedient to him. So... Let's see. Every person has or will walk this earth must submit to the power of death. Man. We just visited uh, a couple today. Uh, some of you know him, uh, Joe Klein, uh, Hummer and Joe Klein. I hadn't seen them for like 20-something years. Uh, many of you have been praying for him. Uh, he's in the hospital. He's a brain tumor. Um, you know, faithful Christian man. Loves the Lord. Hummer, what a, a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, she has such a wonderful, passionate heart for Jesus. Um, got to see her, but we got to pray with Joe. But, you know, he's coming to the end of his life. Okay? And we're sitting there, and we're like, oh, my goodness. This is the effects of what happened in the garden. Death reigns. But it was never supposed to be that way. Ever. Ever. See, that's one thing that evolution teaches us is that evolution is a, or that death is a good thing. But it's not. It was never meant to be that way. You and I understand that death is not good, right? If you've ever been affected by death. We all have. Deep down inside, we know that death is not good. And that's one of the reasons why Romans the 8th chapter says that the whole creation wants to be redeemed. I don't know if you've ever read Romans before, but Romans happens to be my, my favorite book in the entire Bible. And I remember a guy said this a long time ago. He said that if, if you had the Bible, uh, Romans would be like a ring, but Romans, the eighth chapter, would be like the diamond, which would be the brightest spot on that ring. I have a grandson and uh, not too long ago, and we were talking about this, but in... Um, uh, my wife was uh, giving him, for the very first time, sugar babies. Does anybody know sugar babies? Oh, love them, right? Yeah, they get stuck in your teeth and whatever. Uh, but when I used to eat them, I used to take one and put it on my thumb and then one on my index finger and try to do this little war and try to squish them together to see which one would win. That's beside the point. You don't need to know that. But that's how kind of crazy I am. But anyway, uh, she gave him sugar babies for the very first time. He's only four years old. And this is what he said. Murmur, these are delightful treasures. <laughs> that's exactly what he said. And I thought, he is so right. 
Romans, the eighth chapter, is delightful treasures. And in Romans, the eighth chapter, it says this. All of creation groans, waiting to be redeemed. Because we all know that death is really not part of the plan. But because Adam and Eve sin, death reigns and disease and pain and suffering. That's what sin does. We live in a fallen world. And you and I are affected by sin in so many different ways. And yet through Jesus Christ, he gives us the solution. We all have sin, the Bible says. And let me, let me just say this. When we talk about all of sin, you're not born with sin. Okay? We all have this nature to sin. There comes a time where we grow up and uh, uh, we do sin. And then there's that separation. But, but uh, you, you're not born with sin. I know there's some doctrines out there that teach you that Adam's sin uh, just continues to go on and, and that you suffer because of, of the guilt of his sin. No, we're, we're, we're born sinless until we do sin. And then there's a separation that takes place, okay? Um, you can talk to Rick more about that if you want to or me and myself. But our solution is this, Jesus Christ. Second Peter, the third chapter, in verse 19, it says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus affirmed that the purpose of his coming was that men might have life and that they might have it abundantly. In John, the 10th chapter, in verse 10, it says that. And in order to do this, he must not only put uh, an end to death, but he must also give life to those already dead and to those subject to death now. From the Bible, we learned that his death and resurrection both were related to the giving of this life. If somebody has Hebrews, the second chapter, in verses two, uh, 14 through 15, would somebody like to read that? Hebrews, the second chapter. So here, here, Jesus Christ had to come because the penalty was death. Somebody had to pay for that. And so Jesus Christ came. And according to the scriptures, he had to put on flesh so that he can come and take away uh, death uh, that, that we have been in bondage to. Okay? It was necessary for Christ to suffer death in our place uh, if he was to atone for our sins. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, First uh, Corinthians, the fifteenth chapter, and verse three. If someone would like to read that, so we have this confirmation from the Apostle Paul that Christ died according to the Scriptures. He was he he died. He was buried, and he resurrected from the dead. And when he resurrected from the dead, that's when he crushed Satan's head. Right? Okay. Um, but it was Christ's resurrection from the dead that demonstrated his soul mastery over death. He laid down his life of his own free will and took it up again according to his promises. Would someone like to read John, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 18? And then someone else read John, the 2nd chapter, verses 18 through 22? Okay. Okay. Okay, and then who has the other one? John 2, 18 through 22.
So there are some scriptures to show you that Jesus Christ laid down his life for you and for me. I don't, how does that make you feel that somebody would lay their life down for you like that? Okay? I, I don't know. Has that ever happened to anybody before? Um, somebody gave their life in some way? Somebody did something for you? Maybe not like Jesus Christ laying down his life for you, but maybe they did something for you? I'm going to tell you a story, and uh, this is a while ago, and I know Tim and Roberta are here, but when we left um, Maryland uh, to go to Iowa, um, of course, Tim is a, a, a painter well, at that time for, on cars, and I had a big rust spot on our old Mobley, <laughs> which is an Oldsmobile, and he, and he took it in, and he had fixed it, right? And uh, I got it back, and I thought, well, that, that was great. It was, you're, it, you know, I, it was a gift. And so... Um, I looked around my car, and lo and behold, he had changed my tires and put brand new tires on all of them, okay? He did something for me. He sacrificed himself for me, which I would never forget, and I still don't. And every time I see you guys, I always remember that, that you had fixed my rust spot, but that you had put brand new tires on my car so that I could travel 1,200 miles to Marshalltown, Iowa, whom we're praying about now. And I thought, wow, what a gift, right? Right? See, that's what Jesus Christ did. He laid down his life for you and for me. Willingly. So that we don't have to receive the punishment of death that we deserve. That we don't demand. We want mercy and we want grace. Isn't that awesome that someone would do that for you? Sure. I think it's pretty cool. Okay. So, so what do we have to do? What's our response to that? See, I don't know uh, where you're at, but uh, maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, you know what? I'm thinking about my life. I'm thinking about my sin uh, and what it has done to me. And, And it could be a number of things. Maybe you're sitting there and you go, you know what? I need forgiveness of my sin because I don't want death and I want life. And life comes through Jesus Christ. Maybe you're sitting there and thinking about, you know what? I'm thinking about the way I treated my spouse or the way that I treated my kids or, or maybe I gossiped or maybe I hurt somebody or maybe I slandered somebody or maybe I put somebody down uh, along the way. Because I remember he said in James, just one law broken, you've broken them all. Okay? And you can't get to God in your sin. God gave us his son, Jesus Christ, so that we can have the opportunity to be with him for all eternity. But we can't get there in our own righteousness and our own good deeds. On your best day, your righteous deeds are but filthy rags before the Lord. But God says, you know what? I got a plan. It's through Jesus Christ. He can forgive you of your sins. He can make you righteous. He can make you in a right standing before the Lord. He can forgive you of your sins. And if anything should happen to you because you've been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you could be with me for all eternity. Does that sound good? I think it does. So here I am. My wife is trying to share the gospel with me. And at that time, when she was sharing the gospel with me, I was thinking... I never did anything wrong. I never sinned. And here's what I said. I never murdered anybody. See, in my mind, I'm thinking that you have to murder somebody in order to be bad and to be sinful. But then I realized through the gospel and the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of the gospel, I realized that I was totally wrong and that I needed to do something about it. And on March 10th, 1985, that's when I confessed Jesus as my Lord and Savior and was baptized into Christ. So, so where are you? I don't know. We're, we're talking about all this stuff for the last week, and, and maybe some of you are teetering, and you're thinking, you know what? I want to make a decision for Jesus Christ, but I don't know. Uh, I, I, maybe I need to know more, and, and that's okay. That's why you have Mark, and that's why you have... Rick, and that's why you have your elders here. You can talk to them about salvation. And they can talk to you more about Jesus Christ and what he, is, what he can do for you. Amen? 
But let me just give it to you in a nutshell because there's so many scriptures that we can look to, but I just want to give you what Jesus says. Does that sound good? I want to give you the red letter words because that's what people want to hear. If Jesus doesn't say it, a lot of times they're like, I'm not going to believe it. But I'm going to give you the red letter words from Jesus Christ and you're going to hear it for yourself. So if somebody would like to stand and read John the 8th chapter in verse 24, John the 8th chapter in verse 24, okay, Roberta, you got that, Matthew the 10th chapter in verse 32, somebody, Matthew the 10th chapter in verse 32, who'd like to read that, okay, we got, is it Tyler, okay, man, uh, Baltimore's fine, or it's, what are, what are you, state, okay. Okay, thank you very much. And then somebody read Luke, the 13th chapter, verse 3. Somebody going once? Yes, ma'am. And then Mark, the 16th chapter, and verse 16. Because there's a solution, okay? You got it? Okay, John. Here's the solution, okay? Listen to John 8, 24. Okay, there's Jesus Christ. What is he saying? You will die in your sins if you do not believe in me. That's Jesus. Okay, Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 32. Okay, there's Jesus. Man, you got to confess that Jesus Christ, that you believe in him, right? And make that good confession. Okay, Jesus' words again, Luke, the 13th chapter, verse 3. Okay, unless you repent. Boy, if we could have time to talk about repentance, that's not a word that we talk about in church anymore, right? But repentance means to change. Okay, and then John, what's the last one? There you go. Jesus' word. He that believeth and is baptized will be saved. Okay? So there's the solution. You've got to believe that Jesus is the Christ. You've got to believe that he died for your sins. Believe that he was buried in a tomb. Believe that he was resurrected from the dead. You've got to make that confession that you believe in your heart that he died for you. I remember one time uh, we had this Bible challenge where we were supposed to read four chapters a day. Remember we used to do that a long time ago? Well, we did it back in, uh, Mar- or back in Iowa in Council Bluffs. And uh, there was this one gentleman that had uh, never been, didn't read the New Testament, never d- done it before. And so he decided that he was going to take that challenge and just read God's word and let God's word speak to him. And he came to this verse and he says, man, I need to confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior I mean, he had, he'd been going to church for his entire life and never had done that, never been baptized. And so he read these scriptures and he says, I need to do something, and which was a cool thing. Okay, so there is the belief in Jesus Christ, confess him as Lord and Savior, and then there's the repentance. Repentance. You know you sin, you know you've done wrong, but God wants us to repent, to change. And I kind of look at it this way. Repentance is an ongoing thing. Amen? It's not just one time where you repent at your salvation. Repentance is ongoing. But then there's, the Bible says this. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So I don't know where you're at, and maybe you're thinking about it, but maybe you're, maybe you're all saved. Okay? Or maybe you think you're saved, or maybe you're questioning you're saved then you need to talk to somebody and and do what's right. True? Okay. Let me just uh, uh, wrap this up just real quick here. Um, Years ago, there was this German theologian by the name of Frederick Frederick Schillemacher who who did much to shape modern liberal theology. He was sitting alone on a bench in a city park as an old man, a policeman, thinking that he was a vagrant Uh, came over and shook him and asked him, who are you? To which he replied, I wish I knew. He didn't know who he was. I will say this, because we've been talking about evolution and we've been talking about science and, and dinosaurs and what have you. Science will never answer these questions, folks. 
Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? Those questions have to be answered by your creator, your God. Now, your worldview, because that's what we talked about in the very beginning, your worldview determines how you are going to answer those questions. And I'm telling you that if you've got the wrong worldview, then you're going to be a very unhappy, sad person. See, the naturalistic or evolutionary view teaches that death is natural. Death is not natural. That death is what actually helps us to evolve to the next level. Death is a good thing. That's what they teach you. But according to creation, the creation or biblical worldview, it, it matches exactly what our heart is telling us, that death is not good. I saw Joe there, like I said, and I'm like, oh my goodness, he's getting ready to die. I hate death. Okay? Suffering is wrong. It is not good. Do you like to suffer? Nobody likes to suffer. Something is wrong with this world. The Bible even tells us, like I said in Romans 8, and I would ask you to go there and read it for yourself, that the whole world, creation groans, ready to wait to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. And that is the whole story of the Bible, starting from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. God made a good world in the beginning, right? Sin entered in that world. God had to put, to put death into that world because of sin. Death is the result of sin. But the good news is that Jesus Christ came. He died on a cross. He offers forgiveness of sin. And anybody who will confess him as Lord and Savior, believe on him, believe in his resurrection from the dead, repent of their sins, be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, you will have life. If evolution is true, there's no purpose of life. If evolution is true, then we are an accident. If evolution is true, you don't go anywhere when you die. If evolution is true, nothing you do or say will ever matter. But if creation is true, then there is a creator. And if creation is truth, there is a purpose for life. Right? So if somebody would like to read Colossians, the first chapter in verse 16, here is your purpose for living. Well, I kind of gave it away. <laughs> somebody read it, okay? So everything is being created, whether invisible, whether it's what we could see above, everywhere. Everything has been created by him, for him, to glorify him. Now, I don't know where you're at and you're like wondering, well, you know, what is my purpose in life? What is my purpose? Your purpose is to glorify God with your life. And some of us who have been Christians for a long time, maybe you've lost your sense of direction or your sense of awe when it comes to God or your relationship with the Lord. Maybe you've lost that, that, uh, uh, the, you know, that purpose where you think, you know what, I'm just going through the motions. Listen, you were created for a purpose. You're created in the image of God. You're his if you're a Christian. You're here to glorify your heavenly father wherever that may be and wherever that takes you. Praise God. See why you can't believe in evolution? <laughs> oh my goodness. Some of the stuff that they believe is just crazy. That's why you have to look at the Lord and say, okay, or look at, the, look at, look at life and say, am I going to believe fallible man or am I going to believe an infallible God? I'm going to trust God. How about you? Okay? God bless you guys. <laughs> Praise God, man. <laughs>